these are some, uh, some facts that you should know about the ship channel, really. We move uh, over 20,000 vessel movements in a year. And uh, I'll come back to that later because that's kind of how most ports are measured by the, uh, the big ships that move in the, in the harbor. Um, but in reality, we move over 200,000 barges. I like to tell people we're a barge port and they get all offended because they want to be big and blue water. But uh, in reality, the uh, petrochemical business moves on barges and that's important for people to understand that that is big business to us. Um, it's a lot of jobs, it's taxes, and the thing that really comes back to the port is that we're the energy capital of America. And it really comes back because we can transport that energy out of here and into here, and that's something that people uh, should be proud of. So here I kind of just broke down, uh, you know, ports, because you kind of know, like, well, how do we measure up to the other ports? And I'm hoping you can see this a little bit. Um, is that dark enough for you? Yeah, on the import side, Houston has about 10% of the national uh, trade. Um, LA is second with about 7%, and then um, uh, New Jersey is third. Uh, New Jersey is kind of quasi New York if you, if you give it New Newark. And then on the export side, we're, we have about 13%, followed by New Orleans at uh, 11%, and then Norfolk, Virginia at about 11%. And I tell you this because this is another great message that people should understand about our port. When you measure these two things between imports and exports, you'll see there's a difference in our favor of about $8 billion a year. Now, does anyone have an idea what our our, our trade uh, balance is as a country? It's negative 330 billion, but it's a lot. And so we are actually getting an A on our, on our report card compared to the country, and yet I don't think a lot of people realize that this is how you get an A by exporting and, and how you do it, and it's being done very well down here. This is kind of the snapshot just to show you an average day of the, of the ship movements coming on. What, this is our program where we track the ships coming into Texas. That's what we do from, from Beaumont down to Brownsville. We track those ships and we use that information to share with uh, our members as far as information, market information type stuff. And the way I sort of explain this is go back to that, uh, you know, the blue water ships is how people measure it. And I told you the number 20,000 uh, blue water ship movements. Well, that's about 8,000 arrivals, 8,000 ships showing up here because they come in and they go out, that gives you 16,000, and then they move around within the port, which gives you another 4,000 to the number. That's how we come up with the 20,000 by tracking every time they move within our port. So let's take that 8,000 and compare it to the rest of the United States. The next closest port to us is New Orleans, and not by uh, distance, but by number of ship movements, and they'll do about 6,700 vessel arrivals a year. Okay. After that, it falls off to New York and to LA, and they're about 4,500 vessel arrivals a year. So when you look at it, we do almost twice, you know, when you go to these, uh, you know, country conferences and they go, well, New York and LA, and I'm thinking, we do twice as many ships and we're a barge port, you know. So you, if you can understand that, you should be, you know, letting people know that these, uh, these other ports are not even close as far as the volume and the business that we have going on here. This is kind of where we track the, uh, the ship uh, movements, and you can see it, it, it goes up quite nicely. It's pretty much since 2000 to 2010, it doubled in movements. We were at about 10,000 uh, vessel movements a year, and now we're over 20,000 vessel movements a year. We are projecting a little bit of a pullback next year from what we're seeing and what we're hearing, and we're seeing a little bit of that come into play now. Now that doesn't mean we will see less cargo because the ships are a little bit bigger on the container side, but on the uh, uh, overall vessel count number, we think that we'll, 
we'll pull back a little bit. And then we project in the future that it'll go forward at about the same line, which sort of mirrors global trade. I mean, it's, it's, the, the message is very easy. It's, it's all about global trade now, and we sit on the on-ramp to that, having a great port in our backyard to get up there and do this global trade. Breaking down the vessels that move, uh, you can see that we are about uh, two, uh, two thirds petrochemical. Because we're the energy capital, we're gonna move a lot of oil products and chemical products, okay? I'm gonna talk about three of these here. I'm gonna talk about tanker traffic, which is really the, the oil coming in and going out. And then I'm gonna talk about uh, containers uh, because they seem to get a lot of press and people are interested in that. And we're also going to talk about uh, chemical tankers, just briefly. So the tankers, as you know, the uh, natural gas play is very beneficial to this country. It's a game changer. It's the biggest thing going on. Um, and we're seeing it in the port because our refineries are getting their feedstock from domestically now. So they need less ships to bring the oil here to operate their refineries and, and at, at, they pretty much try and beat about 95% operating capacity. And they're staying there, only they don't need the offshore oil and we're seeing it play out. And you can see it dropping off and we, it's been dropping off at a rate of about 20% uh, a year. Uh, and we think that'll go for a little while until the pipeline uh, capacity can't move it fast enough or the trains bringing it in is not sufficient enough and then it'll kind of stabilize there. But that's a good thing for us to have diversity of, uh, of our feedstock. So we see this coming and um, we uh, project it out in the future to continue to trend downwards and we'll see less tankers. Uh, containers, um, containers are consumables. So no matter what you hear about the Panama Canal, it's just if we got more people, we will have more container ships or more containers. We may not have more ships, we will have bigger ships, but that's what drives it. It doesn't have anything to do whether the Panama Canal is there or not. It does, it will make it a little bit cheaper per box to come through the canal, but the boxes that are coming here anyways the, are really driven by you as the consumer. So. As a thousand people uh, a day move into Texas, that will be what we'll see in increase in our, our uh, uh, boxes coming in. And, and we see that there, and is, uh, what'll happen is, as the canal expands, opens up, probably in about 2015, the ships will make a jump. They're, you know, in the size. They'll shift up to the bigger ships a little bit to the capacity that we have. But it won't be any of this big number. It'll be basically, um, I kind of liken it to if they opened a new Walmart around the corner, all of a sudden you are not going to need new T-shirts. You know, you will buy them when you need them, but the benefit is that they can deliver them. Uh, the, the, the major fear with the Panama Canal was if they didn't expand, they wouldn't be relevant anymore because the ships are getting bigger no matter what and they would just go a different route and that would make things more expensive for us. So we're very fortunate that they're increasing their capacity and keeping our costs down and giving us a uh, different supply chain that we would have out there. Now, the one on the left here is sort of interesting to show you that we're exporting. These ships are going out heavier than they come in, which is key for you really because as these boxes come in, we get a discount because we're shipping them out with more stuff than they came in and they're making good money. When they go into almost all the other container ports in the United States, a lot of empties go out with them because they're not exporting anything out. But because of our chemical companies and plastic resins and all the things that we can put into boxes and ship out of here, we have a very good market advantage. And that's why we see containers ships like to like to come in here as, as we go. And so that's what you see is we, over the years, we measure uh, the drafts of the ships coming in and we wanna see uh, how they compare to when they leave. And that's what that shows you. Now the third uh, segment that I wanted to pull out is the chemical carriers because this has the direct play of the natural gas because this is where the market is exploding is our, our companies being able to manufacture 
uh, take uh, the natural gas and produce their products. And you can see right here by watching what's going on, you can see how this chemical tankers are showing up in abundance now to take these products worldwide. And I'll come back to the chemical carriers later, but I just, if you can just visualize that type of growth in any industry, it's pretty exciting. So in this slide, I just threw this, this as a Panama Canal slide, but I, I just wanted to show you the yellow line, which says that we're a global economy. And if I can sell, so I can sell a widget in your backyard and include my shipping costs cheaper than you can make it, I will be selling it in your backyard. And I think that's what people don't realize, like, no, we're not going to compete, you know. Most of the people, when I talk around the country, like, well, we don't have a port, we're not, you know, and I say, eventually everything you do is on the global market. If it's made cheaper close, then you're in business. But if it can be made cheaper somewhere else in the world and sold to you, you'll buy it. And that's sort of what we're working on. And they just don't realize that I live in Kansas, I don't do anything with a port. And pretty much everything you're wearing, everything in your house is coming, you know, from the cheapest spot in the world. And that's how the market is playing out. And we need to be aware of that, that we are competing globally and we have to take every advantage we have, which is obviously why a lot of companies are relocating here because they want to buy their, their raw materials cheap from anywhere in the world add value to it, and then sell it anywhere in the world. They're not looking to say, I'm going to expand my market in Kansas next year. You know, they're saying, let's go into India, let's go into Brazil, let's go somewhere where we can get volume. Let's buy it cheaper somewhere else and bring it here and add our value to it and then sell it. So they want to be close to this transportation hub we call the port. The other thing I want to show you there is uh, the ship sizes, which just shows you where... Um, the canal was watching the si as the ships grow. And basically the way the, the shipping industry works is, you know, they have to have a return, so they have to look at it as we need 10% return next year. Well, the way to get it is to get a bigger ship. You got about the same crew. The fuel is about the same because of the efficiencies, and basically you get more per box. Um, so with these ships getting bigger, I threw this up here just to give you a visual of the world, because uh, that's my theme here, really. It's just a global economy. We live on, you know, we live on the on-ramp to it. And when you look around, you have to understand <laughs> this is, you know, the red boxes are going, you know, the yellow boxes are going to be very deep. Then they go down to the to the red, and then and then the blue. And we're in the blue. So all these other ports, all these major ports in the world are going deeper because they're chasing these bigger ships, okay? And we're not going deeper. So that's going to end up being our Achilles heel down the road. When you look 100 years down the road, it's going to be an issue for us as a port because these other major ports will, do, will, will draw the business because of the efficiencies of the larger ships. So what's it look like in the United States? I threw down the East Coast because they seem to be more motivated by this. Uh, they're, they're using the Panama Canal to get deeper and use their congressional alleged, uh support and everything. And you can see where they're going deeper all up and down the East Coast. Okay? They want to pretty much get the 50 feet so they can compete. 50 feet is pretty much the new norm uh, for uh, container ships as they come through. Now, container ships is not a... I, I, predominantly, we're a petrochemical port, and that uh, ships are going to stay pretty much, they're not going to grow in size as much as, as container ships will, but this is sort of driven towards the container ships. So in here, I put down, you know, what do the Gulf ports look like, and then the West Coast, so you get an idea of what the depths of, of these ports are. Now, I put 40 feet for Houston because our containers go into two places, primarily. They go into Barber's Cut and Bayport. And those channels, even though our main channel is 45 feet, those small channels into those docks are 40 feet now. Now the Port of Houston Authority is working feverishly, and they're going to pay the bill to get to 45 feet by the time the canal's done. Because if they don't, we're toast. Because those ships will get larger, and if they can't take 45-foot ships at a minimum, then that business will go somewhere else, 
It'll offload, and then they'll come here with whatever absolutely has to come here. But you want to be the first port in the Gulf of Mexico for that ship to come in because then the boxes go off. I was in Virginia a couple weeks ago looking at what they were doing, and they basically are driving as that they're 50 foot, they're deep. When that ship comes out of Europe, it stops there, and once it stops there, they will feed, you know, the middle America, and they will. Because if I got a box and it touches the, the shore of the U.S., I want that box off now, and I want it on a train or a truck on my way to me. I don't want to wait for it to come around to the Gulf of Mexico to go up into Kansas or up into the middle part of the country. I, you know, if I'm going to Chicago with that box, I'll take it off in Norfolk. If it comes here first, then I'll get it out here and ship it up by rail up to Chicago or whatever. So the first place that ship shows owns the business, and that's where uh, 50 feet gets it to you. So this is a challenge for the uh, Port of Houston Authority to get their slips to 45 feet. And they're going through uh, the federal process. They're optimistic about it. So the Achilles heel for our port community, to be fair with you, is our inability to dredge our ship channel. What I've shown up here is a bunch of numbers just to saturate you, really, but really just to say the, the federal government, which is our landlord of maintaining our property, is not doing their part. And we're going to have to have some tough decisions as a community later. Either we're going to have to sit by and say, they're not keeping our dredge channel dredged, and we just sit there and let them put us out of business, or we take an alternate course of business. And that's going to have to be a discussion down the road um, for us as a community. Basically, we need, we dug a 45-foot channel through a 12-foot pond, okay? Very ambitious, the correct thing to do. All our businesses collect, you know, are connected to this lifeblood. So we sit on that channel. That channel silts in. Probably only 5% of that channel is actually at project depth and width right now. And basically what's happening is the federal government's looking at it and saying, well, we can get away without maintaining you right now with this dredging. It's kind of like your house. How long can you go without maintaining any of your equipment in your businesses or anything until finally it's too late? And that's what we're looking at here. We need about $50 million a year as a port to keep ourselves, uh, I mean, it's a known number. 50, 50 to 60 million a year of dredging money, and um, we're getting about 20 uh, to 25 million a year on average to do it. So we are losing uh, the battle with dredging. There is no real optimistic uh, forecast in the future right now. We're working on it. We're going to Washington. We're trying to plead this case uh, that they need to be doing it. So what happens? Why aren't we doing it? Okay, so that's the fair question to ask right now. In 1986, the federal, up to 1986, the federal government paid for all the maintenance. Okay, in 86, they came out and they said, you know what, we're going to charge an ad valorem tax on your import uh, product, and we're going to put that aside in the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund, and we're going to use that money to maintain you. And the, gov and the industry said, go away, we don't believe you, you know, and they go, well, we don't care. It's a tax now, get in line and start paying it, okay? So this money's been going in and the revenue has been going up as we go. And it's actually worked, you know, to, it would be a very, you know, good way to do it, okay? But here's the problem is the more that money that they've taken in over the year, the less they've allocated to the actual industry. So this has been a deficit sliding reduction type tool by the federal government in not maintaining our, our ports and harbors to dredge them out. So what you see is basically when they first started, they were spending 90% the next year, and now they're only spending about 50% of what they collect back into the thing. And this harbor maintenance fund has, you know, eight, nine billion dollars in it, but there's really no money in it. It's somewhere else in the government. And, uh, but so our, our push really is for legislation that would say, hey, what money you collect next year, move it over to do actually the maintenance work like you do for uh, highways and uh, airways and their trust funds. And uh, they're like, well, who's going to make up the difference? 
<laughs> and I'm like, well, wait a second. The fairness is you said you'd collect it to use it for our infrastructure, and you aren't. So the fairness goes back one level back to where you should be uh, allocating this back to why you collect it. So here's what's going to be lost. Okay, and as a community, we are slowly going to ch choke in. Now, when we talk to OMB about this, right, and we say, well, you see, hey, we, we don't have 45 feet anymore. We've only had 43 feet in the ship channel since August because we can't, we have a shoaling spot and we can't dredge out that slope. And so you think about that's two feet less than we should be at, okay? And I'll come back to per foot in a second. So the OMB person would say, well, here, you know, it's really not a problem, Bill, because you just bring another ship, you know? You just, just and, and they're right in that essence on the tankers. See, what happens is the big super tanker, the, the, the very large crew carrier, the VLCC, comes over from the Middle East, and it parks at our, our lightering zone offshore, okay? Big, big ship, right? And then we have these smaller ships called aftermaxes, which are big, big ships by what we see, because they're the big, biggest ones we see in the port, then they run offshore and they bring in that oil, and they make five trips, okay, on the import side. Now, if the draft is now 40, 43 feet, the guy in OMB is right, well, we just make a sixth trip for that tanker to offload. So really what's going to happen? You know, what's the harm, right? But the problem is what they're missing really is we need exports, we need it like the worst way as a country, okay? So when you look on the export side, okay, those ships load here, and then they go, they don't go lighter. They leave here and go to market. So if the market is Europe, the market is South America, the market is Asia, or it's East Coast, or wherever they may be headed off to, that's where they go. And so a foot, okay, on oil, let's say oil, let's use just basic numbers of oil, uh, that aftermax comes in a foot less, or a foot deeper, or a foot less in, in depth, okay? That's 20,000 barrels of, of oil. Let's say oil's $100, just for the easy of my math, $100 a barrel, okay? That's $2 million that they've not, you know, been able to move. Okay, and we've been operating at two feet restriction since August. So every one of those ships, they can't move what amounts to be, you know, $4 million of oil. But that's a barrel of oil. Now you take a barrel of a specialized chemical, which is way more expensive, okay? And then you look at it and you take that foot. You can't afford to, to ship that product. You just, as a business, are going to say, you know what, I can't take a foot off of this and send this to Europe. We're not selling to Europe. Or Europe's not going to buy because they're not going to pay the premium on it. And I think that's what's going to play out first before the inbound thing. Everyone's looking inbound, but I think what we really need to be doing and, and saying, we're going to lose the export side. And the export side is not friendly. It is either you, you weren't a world market, it's just like I said, if they can sell a widget in your backyard, they will be selling. We're doing the same thing. If we can sell it to them in their backyard, we will be selling it to them. But we may not be able to do it because we can't, get our, we can't use our strength, which is our transportation. It all comes down to better, faster, cheaper. And we won't be better, faster, cheaper if we silt in. So in, in just summary of this, really, I, I took like a the little red ship at the bottom and said, okay, if we took $1.5 billion, they're collecting $1.7 million a year in this harbor maintenance trust fund. If, if we use that, we can maintain our ports, but we're not, okay? And when you look at ports, you know, nationwide, what they generate for taxes is $95 billion. So it's a really short-sighted approach towards you know, saving money. What you're spending is one dollar and getting back a hundred dollars, and that thing is lost on Washington because they're saying we are not going to spend another dollar because we're in debt. Did you get the message? We're in debt. And I say, 
you need to prioritize your spending because you're going to kill the goose if you don't. And I'll conclude with that.